Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House US to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode number 21, titled, The Buddhist Soul. Any questions? To start the day off from yesterday, meditation. Does anyone have a question about that? Does Buddhism believe in soul? I'm sorry? Does Buddhism have believe in the soul? Buddhism believe in the soul? That we have a soul. Well, it depends on how you define the soul. Um, but if, you, if that's a way of, the, that's a very key point in the sense that uh, Buddhism is absolutely involved with the idea of former and future life. There, there are some people who want to be what they call modern Buddhists, and they want to say that they don't need former and future life, and they're modern people, and they're scientific, and this is all, that's all completely unproven. And so, meanwhile, they consider it's proving that there is no former and future life. But I like to ask that question back. How would you prove that? <laughs> and who has proven it? Has Richard Dawkins actually proven that? Richard Dawkins did not succeed in pursuing the selfish gene into the future life of any individual person. But does that mean that he disproved the existence of a future life for consciousness of the human being? I think the scientists, basically, the more intelligent ones, they say that um, they can't pass an opinion on that. But the larger sort of scientific materialist view is that since we have the theory of materialism, there is no mind beyond the brain, and therefore when the brain stops, that's the end of it. And uh, that's an established fact sort of thing. Oh, I put the wrong battery in the wrong area. Uh, that's an established fact. And uh, in fact, I once was in Bellevue Hospital. I wasn't an inmate, right? <laughs> But I went there because uh, I was meeting with a a neuroscientist who was deeply hoping to get the Dalai Lama into his lab and put him into one of his machines to see what the Dalai Lama's brain was doing, which he did not succeed in doing. Uh, But anyway, he was talking to me, and then I was, in the context of our talking, I said to him, well, you know, you... What you could get is, I think we could arrange to get some of these Tibetan yogis. The Dalai Lama could help with that arrangement. I don't think he wants to come to your lab, but you could, you could um, arrange that those yogis who are able to leave their bodies with their consciousness and simulate the after-death state, you could then study the body when they are out of body. You know, they might allow you to do such an experiment, I said to him. And he went completely berserk. He was a Latino gentleman, and uh, he was, um, I think, Venezuelan or something, and he was, but a distinguished scientist, and he went totally nuts about how, don't say that in this place. It is just, we are certain that there is no, nothing, there's no consciousness after death. He said, I've had, I've had corpses in my fMRI, and believe me, there's no action in those brains. He said, those brains are flat. So we know that there's no consciousness after death, he said. And he was so vehement, you know, and he was a Latino, so he was like, Muy, like, serioso, furioso. So I was like, okay, I'll never mention it again. And uh, so uh, about 36 hours later, I was going to uh, a subsequent meeting about this same conference we were organizing with Beth Israel Neuroscience uh, Hospital Branch, Pediatric neuro- Neuroscience Branch. And uh, I, the, the Pakistani taxi driver was alarmed because I burst out laughing. Uh, because somehow it finally worked its way through my head that that gentleman had felt that, you know, he, as a great neuroscientist, had discovered the nothingness, the nothing status of human consciousness after death. He felt that as a discovery that had been made, which means that he was certifiably insane, actually, properly in Bellevue. 
Because who, who's, who's going to discover nothing? How are you going to do that? I mean, you don't have to be a scientist. Just think about it. Where is nothing? <laughs> what is it? Nothing. Can you get into nothing? Can anything go? In their physical thing, you know, the law of, second law of thermodynamics, no energy is ever destroyed. You know, that's uh, one of their theories. Because, uh, because something cannot become nothing. So they so accept that principle. But somehow they think, therefore, that means if they say consciousness is nothing when the brain ceases to function, that means that consciousness isn't anything now. It's just the brain doing something. So that, does, that means not only do you not have a soul, but that means you don't really exist. You're just a robot, kind of, a brain robot. Sume. Thinks it's sume. And you know that you're going to cook something for lunch. Or have something. And you don't really exist. So that means we all don't exist, actually. Really. We just illusorily think we exist. And is that the same? What do we call someone who runs around thinking they don't exist? <laughs> A psycho, actually, don't we? We call that person a psycho. Why? Because since they think they don't exist in some way, they're not responsible for their presence or their actions. And therefore, we, you know, that's like sociopath, psychopath, right? Tony Perkins in the shower, right? <laughs> because he's not responsible, he you know, doesn't know what he's doing because he doesn't exist. So, um, put it this way, Buddhism is commonsensical and realistic. And we do not know, no one sort of can take a hold of consciousness. And, um, but you know, we don't deny that we have it. And that it's something. We don't know what exactly, but everyone is conscious and it's something. Right? I mean, you're the, you think you're there. Mm -hmm. Now, you may be, the way you think we're there, Buddhism would agree with, uh, like I had a debate with Daniel Dennett once, who was a philosopher at Tufts University and a big... He tried to get into the Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins market, like Christopher Hitchens did, and make it be a bestseller talking about how everything is nothing and religion sucks and all this kind of thing. And I had a debate with him about, he said, I have discovered that Daniel Dennett, I couldn't find Daniel Dennett, he says to me. And, uh, and therefore, I'm sure that I will not have any future life. And when my, this current body stops, that's it for me. I'm, I'm certain of that. So uh, then I asked him, I said, well, you know, you're a philosopher and you know the philosophy of science and you know that in the quantum era that there's areas in the super subtle level of material reality that people don't know what's going on. They're just making statistical, probabilistic guesses about what's happening. And they don't know if, that a particle is really there. It might be a wave, a particle. They have no idea. It doesn't obey the laws of ordinary coarse matter, you know doesn't obey laws like that. You know, you have spin of two particles like thousands of miles apart that seem to be influencing each other simultaneously, which should be impossible, for example. You know. So I said, you, you cannot have examined that level of your physical being to be sure that there isn't some continuum of something that will be there that it will, maybe, may, may not have the name Daniel Dennett and it certainly won't have tenure at Tufts in the philosophy department. <laughs> But that there's some continuity from your existence, you cannot actually say that by examination. And he had to admit that. He admitted that. And then he said, but he said, I don't care, though, he says, because I don't have to have a future life. I can be ethical anyway, he said. So I said, well, I'm not asking whether you can be ethical. I know you're ethical. But I'm questioning your assertion to the public that you're certain that you will not exist after you die. There'll be nothing that exists. And uh, he then didn't answer that because he'd already admitted that he couldn't be. Uh, but he didn't change his statement. And instead he said, yeah, but I can still be ethical, is what he kept saying. So then I had to say, well, yes, but how ethical? What would you sacrifice to be ethical? Since finally you're not there to experience the consequence of whatever you've done in life. So the our materialistic philosophy, this brings us, so anyway, I'll start, we'll, go, we'll do this in the meditation. So... Buddha denied what the Indians thought of as a soul, mm -hmm. meaning a fixed thing that is the, is the fixed, like a barcode of sume, mm -hmm. that's an unchanging thing, mm -hmm. so that when you think of something happened to you when you were 18 years old, mm -hmm. and now you feel you're the same exact person, there's something there that hasn't changed all that time, and that 
ceiling is misplaced, according to Buddha's analysis. So he agrees with Daniel Dennett in a way that you can't find an unchanged fixed thing that's the essential you, the essential identity, even the word identity, right, comes from Latin. Idem means the same. So identity means the sameness, really, basically, is what it means. So our feeling that we have such an identity, a fixed, self-sufficient, it's almost absolute, you could say, unchanging identity, he said that's mistaken, that's not correct. But Buddha said there's no such thing. But continuity, then he said there is. But he was a little reluctant to go back to the soul word, because he knew people are so strongly invested in their, their, their absolute reality of their essential self, which, which is a very liberating experience, apparently, he considers it to be, to discover that there's no such thing, and yet to still be a, pre, a relative self. That's, that's the Buddhist enlightenment experience, mm -hmm. supposedly. And uh, that's so important. He didn't want to give any kind of concept to people that they could hang that thing, feeling of rigid, unchanging identity on. Do you follow me? Because it's a big thing to be relational identity, to realize that you're completely relational. When you realize mm -hmm. that, you become much more connected to everything, mm -hmm. and it completely changes how you connect to the world. Do you know what I mean? That mm -hmm. it, and it actually relieves you of tremendous suffering in his analysis. Mm -hmm. And this we'll get to in, in, toward the, in a few days, actually, more in detail about the whole subject of selflessness, as they call it, mm -hmm. or identitylessness, mm -hmm. and what that means and how... But I could say right away, because people do worry about it. People both worry about it and they wrongly think, or they wrongly like it about Buddhism. Some of these so-called modern Buddhists, they like the selflessness idea because they think it agrees with uh, the materialist scientific idea, scientific materialist idea, that a human being is just really a kind of biological mechanism. And, you know, the individual has no continuity. The genes have a continuity, but the individual person doesn't have a continuity. So the individual person ultimately doesn't exist. And it's just a momentary genetic byproduct, you know, carrying your genes from A to B. You know. well, so, what does, yeah? What does continue, then, from life to life? Well, that's a, something subtle, something super subtle. Buddhists have a term for it they call, in the esoteric levels, as I said, Buddha was hesitant to make anything, he calls it continuity of mind, I mean, is the word they use, at the, at the simplest level. Chitta Santana, the continuity of mind. But uh, then what is that exactly? They're a little vague about that on purpose, not to encourage, as I was saying, the idea that there's this fixed thing continues, the totally fixated thing continues. What, what's the matter to me? I'm just getting my notebook. Oh, you're getting notebook. And... Um, but in the esoteric thing, at the more developed sort of subtle levels of Buddhist science, in what is the area of what's called the tantras, they call it, they have various terms. One of them is the spiritual gene. The, the genes from the parents, they have a term for that, actually, although they didn't have Watson and Crick's particular, you know, eureka moment, but they consider that there's, uh, you know, they, could, they, they associate them with with uh, blood, ovum and semen, you know, the genes coming from the parents. But then there's a third gene involved in a being, which is their own continuity of consciousness coming from previous life, which selects those parents to those, the union of those three genes, those two genes of the two parents. Uh, it selects that as a vehicle for building a new body. And it's very patriotic for an American, very nice, because the mother's gene is red, associated with blood. The father's is white, associated with semen and bone. And the spiritual gene is a deep blue. <laughs> Red, white, and blue. Could be French, then. What? Could be French. Yeah, 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 from France, yes. Red, white, and blue. Yes, exactly. So, uh, but we don't want to use that word, right? We went to freedom fries. Right. So it's a freedom. The freedom gene. Freedom gene, yeah. So, so... Uh, uh, so that, they, they have different terms. That's at the esoteric level, though. It, it, traditionally, it was at the esoteric level. But now that, those levels are becoming all available in, uh, in modern society because modern society is different and we're not 98% agricultural, you know, illiterate farmers and peasants, etc., like they were in Asia over the, over the millennia. But, uh, but the, you know, the, the, as I say, the selflessness thing is often misunderstood because those people who think that they don't exist because of their addiction to, or their 
conditioning to scientific materialism. They think Buddha pre-discovered that. So they kind of, I've met a lot of people at Zen centers, I confess to say, not, not to cast aspersions on the Chan tradition, which I really like in the Zen tradition, but some versions of it who think that uh, they go and do a session and what they're waiting for is to disappear. <laughs> and I always kid them, like, you had some disappearing experiences on that last long session you did, and wasn't it great, and you didn't have to worry about anything because you weren't there for a brief moment. Medita or maybe meditatively it might have been a while, but to you it seemed like a moment, I said. But the boring thing, isn't it, is that now you're back and you have to listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> or worry about your parking tickets or whatever. And they would snicker kind of guiltily. So there's an idea where selflessness was misunderstood as just meaning ultimate non-existence, which is incorrect. And then the other idea is that, uh, uh, you know, uh, selflessness is some kind of, um, it's wrong or something like that. You know, it's, it's, that is a, it's a mistake, you know. So, but the point is that selflessness means that you, yourself is a relational thing and you don't have the absolute self that you feel you have. It's not absolute. It's only relative. And, uh, and so you have a self, you know. The, it's the person who discovers their selflessness is the relative self type of thing. The person who becomes a Buddha is the relative self and become a relative Buddha, you know, etc. And to do that, they have to understand what the absolute is, and then they call the absolute emptiness or selflessness to critique all notions that a relative structure can be absolute, you know, which is very logical of them. You know. Similar like the idea, the Protestant idea of the absolute otherness of God, for example, is, which is like the Islamic idea, that, there's, that God is an absolute being that is not related to the universe, but somehow creates it in an off moment or something, or accidentally, and, uh, and yet uh, has absolute power, authority, and therefore that the absolute can act. When absolute means non-relational, so therefore absolute cannot do anything, by definition. It, so it's, those theological things are just really dogmatic assertions and cannot be logical. And Buddhism is very logical. So they, that's why the absolute being emptiness means that all we have actually is the relative. And that the emptiness means that every relative thing is empty of any non-relative essential component. Okay? And at first that seems obvious, so it isn't even a startling statement. But what is not obvious too is our an unconscious habit of feeling that our self is absolute. And more subtly, the idea that when we, you know, the, our use of words, or I see a piece of wood or floor... I feel that the floor has what some modern sociologists call a kind of massive facticity. I love their expressions. Yeah. And it has a massive objectivity that's sort of like massive. And it's a floor in itself. And philosophers from Plato right on down to Bertrand Russell, they, they always think, and, in, and the contemporary unphilosophically self-examined scientists, they think that when they see something that it has a kind of absolute essence to it. And then they want to find a way of understanding that absolute essence, they think, maybe through mathematics. And then when they have a hold of the absolute core of the things, they'll be able to control it with their theories. That's the kind of, that's the delusory scientific dream that the Buddha, Buddha rejected 2,500 years ago, as he predated quantum physics by 2,500 years, in, in stating that he had discovered the infinite divisibility of all things, including atoms. In other words, that everything dissolves under anal analysis. There's no analysis resistant absolute core to anything. And yet, that doesn't mean the relative things don't exist. They do, but all totally related. No, no absolute aspect in them. That's what it is. And um, so that's just a preview of what we'll talk about more at length a few sessions from now. Okay? okay. And you got me into this trouble. <laughs> There's more to come. So yeah, we have a soul. You can call that third gene the soul gene, if you like. And and that's why in their belief, the way you behave in your life, and not only your physical actions and verbal actions, but your thoughts, which are mental actions, and shape your they shape your evolution. So we are also they preceded Darwin. We are evolutionary beings. What we do affects or shape shapes our life. The reason fact we're humans is because we shaped our life in such a way that we, we evolved toward where we wanted such a form. 
we were attracted towards other human beings, our human parents, and born in a womb. It's not an obvious thing that you'd be attracted toward the human body. If you were like a happy crocodile, rolling around in the mud and hopping on the occasional zebra that comes across the mud hole, you know, it's not very obvious that you would like to be a strange-looking person with soft skin and no big jaw and, you know, can't swim that well. And, and um, I don't think we could lie in a mud hole with our eyes sticking out and hop on a zebra and chomp it down very easily. Not, not at all. <laughs> we could play the piano, but a Muslim crocodile I wouldn't think of playing the piano. <laughs> So how do you evolve to where you think the human form is something marvelous? Human is actually feeble. We don't really have big claws. We don't have big teeth. Only the vampires in Hollywood do. We don't have, you know, we're not that strong. But, but, and we're sort of chicken-hearted, actually, a little bit. And therefore, we learned to talk. We had to hide while the tigers were stalking outside our caves and things. And then we started chatting when we hid. We were hiding in the cave. We started talking and chatting. We had like meditation sessions. And then we figured out how to make spears and guns and arrows and bows and tiger hunting mechanisms. And we became stronger than the tiger using our intelligence, shared intelligence, our connectedness. Right? And we inherited the knowledge of making these things from, from parents and ancestors because we got, had language and we had this brain. But if you were a crocodile, a weird-looking person running around carrying a heavy brain, that would not be an obvious form that you would be uh, gravitate toward, in fact, if you think about it. So, uh, as, I, as I said to Dennis, I said, evolution is not, a, we're not talking <coughs> creationism here. Evolution is not a problem in the non-materialistic philosophical view of evolution. <coughs> there is evolution, but the individual is responsible for their evolution to some extent. Their circumstances also, their environment is important. But the individual involves themselves. They choose their evolution. And how? How do you get to be human? By cultivating altruism. Being more aware of the feelings of other beings. How do you get to be a mammal even? It's not an obvious thing. Much more convenient. Drop some eggs in the sand. Put some sand over the top with your paw and take off and go for a swim. Carry that being around in your belly for nine months. That's again not really... Comfy thing. It's not that comfy. Guys wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> they wouldn't. They would not. But, but, and then you are a being that's carried in the body of another member of your species, and then you're utterly helpless and dependent on that member and associated pals and husbands and fathers and whatever, your uncles and things. You're, you're helpless for, for decades, actually. Mm -hmm. By puberty, you think you're not helpless, but we know that you are, until you're in, you know, graduate from something. You know? Anyway, so so the Buddhist view of evolution is actually more biologically intimate for the individual by far than the Darwinian one, because the in, in the in the materialist one, you don't have any say about it, and you don't re re reap the effects of any good thing you did in your life because you don't exist after you die. You just your genes go on if you're lucky, but that's relevant to you, because you never really ex did exist. Right? So therefore, you know, uh, never mind. I, I won't go on with that. But we, we can come to that and debate. Because I know that some of you will probably be a little bit upset by the idea of having to worry not only about your pension, your retirement, <laughs> and your funeral plot, but your next life. That's going to be upsetting. <laughs> when we're not used to that. And, and uh, it is upsetting. People worry about it. My, my 92 year old, my grandfather was like 92 already when I started studying Buddhism formally. And we started debating that topic when I would come visit home from the monastery where I was. And then by around 95 or 6, he actually caved his lifelong materialism. And he realized he might have to hedge his bets and worry about it. <laughs> and he became a changed person for the last three or four years. He died in his 90, late, almost 98. He was trying to make 100. He was bent on getting 100, but he made 98. And he was very changed from about 95, 96, like that. Oh, wow. Because he realized that if he was really grumpy the whole time, then this grumpiness might lead him toward a more grumpy future life, which he didn't really want. He didn't really think that'd be nice because other people might be grumpy back, or other beings. Here. Okay, well, let's meditate a little bit. That was a good question.